May I speak in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. My talk is based on the Gospel reading for today, Mark chapter 8 from verse 31. This is about Jesus predicting his death and the weight of the cross. From Mark's point of view, this passage is the pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry. It comes just after Peter had said that Jesus is the Messiah and just before the Transfiguration. Previously, in chapters 7 and 8, we have a series of miracles and events, the feeding of the 5,000 and then the 4,000, the disciples being told not to worry that one loaf of bread seems insufficient to feed 13 people, the blind man is given his sight and the deaf and dumb man can hear and speak. The lame man is able to walk. These are all linked back to the prophecies found in Jeremiah chapter 6 and in Isaiah chapter 35 about the lack of understanding by the people on the need to follow God's commandments. Everyone would have known about these prophecies, but they did not make the connection between the people who had been healed or the message from the events that all things are possible with God. Even with his teaching and explanations, the disciples show a lack of understanding of the deeper meaning behind what was said, and that Jesus is the Son of Man. He was seen as the Messiah, and from their viewpoint, he would free them, free them from the Romans. Also, when Jesus tells the people he has cured not to talk about what had happened to them, they of course do. So his fame spreads even more, and to be seen as the Messiah, the King, would be a direct challenge to both the Roman and Jewish authorities. Jesus knew this, hence he asked people to be quiet about being cured. But, but would you keep quiet if you could suddenly see or are no longer disabled after 38 years? His teaching, his preaching and healing was upsetting the status quo of the kingdom, kingdoms on earth. They would act to stop him, to stop his work. Things were moving fast, so Jesus knew that he did not have much time left in his earthly ministry. And no doubt Jesus was frustrated with his disciples because they were still relating things from a human viewpoint and could not see these things from God's viewpoint. Maybe that's undesirable, that's understandable. They saw Jesus' charisma, his wisdom, his acts of healing, being caring and compassionate, but the heart of his message did not sink in. So we come to this passage when Jesus tells his disciples that, as the Son of Man, he would suffer at the hands of the chief priests and their council and will be killed and after three days will rise again. Mark writes, he spoke plainly about this. It seems that no punches were pulled when he told them. It must have been a huge shock to them which led to Peter's outburst. Have you been told by someone you love that they do not wish to live anymore, or are going to die soon? If you have, it was no doubt a difficult time for you, as you absorbed the enormity of what you have been told. The normal response is to, tr is to try to dissuade them, or to poo-poo the timescale. Some years ago, my wife and I went to stay with my father, who lived in Guernsey, in the Channel Islands. My brother, who also lives in Guernsey, kept an eye on him, popping in to see him a couple of times a week, and Dad would go to his house for Sunday lunch. My mother had died six years earlier. My sisters and I would phone every week, and in the weeks running up to our visit, he would tell us, I'm 89, you know. I will be 90 next year. He was getting frail, which is why we stayed with him so my brother and his wife could go on holiday. Dad had a bit of a cold, which did not seem to bother him. However, 
At three o'clock one morning, he banged on our bedroom door, saying he could hardly breathe. We called the ambulance. He was taken to hospital where he was treated in A&E, and we saw him taken to the ward. Later that morning, I got a phone call from the ward sister, saying that Dad was refusing to take his pills that he'd been prescribed by his GP for his various ailments. Could I come and talk with him? Did he really mean to stop taking them? Did he understand the consequences of not taking them? That was a bit of a surprise, as Dad had been very careful over the years to take the right pill at the right time and on the right day. When I got to the hospital, Dad greeted me with, I suppose you've come to get me to change my mind. He was ready for an argument. So I asked him why he had stopped taking his pills, and he said that he was 89 and didn't want to be 90. He missed Mum and wanted to be with her. So he didn't want to be kept going with all the pills he was taking. He thought by not taking his pills, he would die pretty quickly. As you can imagine, this was a big, big shock. It was obvious that he'd made up his mind. Nobody could force him to take those pills, so I did not argue. We talked about it and then prayed. He was relieved that there was no argument, so I left his bedside on good terms. My mind was reeling. I and my brothers and sister had no inkling that Dad felt the way he did. Well, he recovered from his breathing problem and was moved from the hospital to a nursing home which he found very nice and comfortable. He even agreed to start taking his pills again. He'd been there just three days when he died in the arms of the nurse who was giving him his morning wash. It happened very quietly and peacefully. So, I can understand the reason for Peter's passionate outburst, telling Jesus it was just not right that he would suffer and be killed. The Messiah was the king and could not be killed. If a Messiah dies at the hand of the authorities, then he must be a false prophet, and there have been plenty of those over the past years trying to rebel against the Romans. Jesus was not a false pro prophet, he was the Messiah. Peter knew that, so how could it be? It had not dawned on Peter then that as Jesus was the Son of God, it was God's way. There was a disconnect between them. Jesus, for a caring and compassionate man, his response to his friend was very harsh. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have the mind of the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Maybe this anger was also a vent to his frustrations, but he made it very clear that his message was from God. Peter, even then having declared that Jesus was the Messiah, still don't, did not understand, after all, the teachings and explanations that Jesus had given. The deep meaning of his ministry and his teachings still eluded him, and why things had to happen as Jesus foretold. He would not come to fully understand until after Jesus' resurrection, and everything he had been told by Jesus would fall into place. For the man who after the resurrection was to lead the apostles in the spreading of the gospel far and wide, this rebuke must have been a huge shock and dispiriting, especially as Jesus did it so publicly and in front of his friends. But the rebuke had to be made, because the kingdom of heaven would not come to earth without Jesus' death. As Tom Wright puts it, it's about the radical defeating of the deep-rooted evils in our society, not the destruction of the world that God made and loves. Mark then follows this incident with Jesus calling the crowd to join the disciples, and he said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their soul will lose it. 
and for, but whoever loses their soul for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This statement recorded by Mark is his definition of what being a Christian means. Here is the heart of our faith. By following Jesus, it will not be easy, as he makes it clear. There will be obstacles, dangers and risks on the journey. But it is the only way for us to be part of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. This is the message that Peter and his fellow apostles started to spread after Jesus' resurrection. Finally, they fully understood the meaning of Jesus' teaching and how everyone can share in the heavenly kingdom. Let us pray. Father, unlike Peter, we have from the start, through the gospel writings, the knowledge and understanding of Jesus' ministry and what is required of us to be his followers, for us to become part of your heavenly kingdom. Through your Holy Spirit, may we have the strength and passion that Peter showed in his life for your word and to live our lives in your service. Amen.